first media day since you've been here. We haven't had to ask you about a hypothetical when it comes to the new new ballpark. So just how exciting is that? What's kind of the energy like as, as it relates to that? Well, it's great. Um, it's going up, uh, you know, every day you see the minimal changes and then some days you see big changes when something a uh, big steel structure gets erected or a huge staircase goes up. But, yeah, the, the construction on the ballpark has been fun to follow. And it's one of those things that coming to work and going home each night, you, you peek at it because it's exciting. But, you know, it's just it's just one of the things going on. It certainly doesn't take your focus off of what you're getting ready to do now. But, yeah, it's exciting to see that thing go up. I mean, my gosh, you know, to, to see, uh, you know, images and, and drawings and then to see it start to take shape is, is pretty fascinating. I've never had a chance to watch something from start to finish, so it's uh, pretty cool. How much has that played into recruiting for you guys? Oh, it's great. I mean, anybody that, that, that's come to campus uh, since last March that's seen the site and seen the activity and then see the uh, the shape and, and, and some of the, the structures now, it's 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 real. And it's, uh, it's definitely, I think, for kids that are considering uh, where they're going to go to school um, in the very near future, uh, that's that's a big part of of them seeing themselves here and, and envisioning the space that they'll train in and that they'll locker in that they'll work on their swing in that they'll play in front of great fans in and that they'll ultimately have a great college experience in so uh, I think every facility uh, the one we're in right now this is a place where guys come build their swing each day and, and players want to see the space and know where they're going to spend their time developing as people as students and as ball players and that's a space for them that they know they'll spend baseball development in. So it's always a big deal to kids. Um, everybody wants to be part of something special. I don't know of anyone that says, I want to have an average experience. I want to have a big time experience. And that's what that's what everybody wants. And so that's exciting because I think kids can look at that and say that uh, that's a, a pretty uh, huge investment in our sport on behalf of our university by some amazing people, which means that baseball is a big deal here. Some days you see small changes, other days you drive by and there's another structure going up. What's it like when you drive by and you see something and kind of goes through your head? Wow, that wasn't there the last time I went past here. Well, at one streak, I went over there three times a day during Christmas break. I was bored. Now it's probably reduced down to one. Um, but yeah, it's just it's just neat to see, kind of, you know, how those guys build things. The uh, the Manhattan construction's been awesome about letting us have a an inside look at what they do and. Uh, they're great people, and they want that to turn out just as awesome as we do. So it's just been, a, like I said, it's been an amazing experience to see something go up and to get to know the people and know how much pride they're taking in putting that facility together is really cool. Is there any incentive for this team just in terms of kind of sending Alec P. off the right way? Sure. There's a tremendous amount of incentive for us to, to go out and have a great season, um, starting today with a great practice. I mean, we wouldn't have it any other way, no doubt. Do your emotions differ maybe going into this season than past seasons with the history you have at Alley Pete? They don't differ at all. Uh, it's important that we get the most out of every single day that this team and this moment in time capitalizes on this unique opportunity. That's critical to us, and that means a lot to us, and we've never looked at it any other way. Um, we've got to get better today. We've got to get better tomorrow. We've got to get better Wednesday. We'll take Thursday off and then – attack the game again on Friday. We're not going to ever change the way we try to build a team because I think there's only one way to do it, and that is to uh, try to build your players up every single day and learn and grow inside the game. We've done that every year we've ever played here. We would never change our approach. Um, you couldn't try harder because of the last year there, and you certainly wouldn't be any different in terms of your ability to get your team to live in the moment. So it's just a, a natural one of those, those exciting – progressions in a program's history that but you can't take your eye off the this moment in time and and uh, we won't is this team where you want it to be at this point in the process uh we're where we are because it's it's just on today's date what is it february 4th third or fourth because it's where we're at today um we're working hard uh we've gotten uh good field time with the nice weather we've had in the last four or five days so we are physically uh, close to being in shape for this time of year. We've seen some really good live pitching in the last three days, so that's a, certainly a positive thing. Would you always want your team to be slightly more advanced? Uh, sure, but we are today where we're at. We know exactly what we need to work on this afternoon, and we're going to attack today. And I think when you look at your team and you say, okay, if we can identify each day places to improve and exactly how we want to attack it, then we have a chance to move forward. So. Um, we're getting better. 
and we're learning, and the the roster's challenging it's each other. You know, the pitchers are challenging the hitters, and vice versa, which is uh, an important thing to do this time of year as you prepare for opening day. Not you know what 10, 12 days away, whatever it is. Some good live pitching, of course, without Harrison Field, Jonathan Beasley, guys like that. Who are some of them that you see kind of stepping up in the big roles? Well, uh, just going back over the weekend, uh, Mitchell Stone threw well. Mitchell missed last year uh, due to injury, broke his uh, foot early in the season, and uh, he did an amazing job with himself over the course of the season of staying in great shape despite his foot injury, uh, really matured, I think, um, as a young man and as a student and went off and had a really, really good summer in Cape Cod and has come back this year. His work ethic is top shelf. Um, the maturity and the way in which he goes about everything he does is super impressive. And, and so I'm really excited for Mitchell to be back healthy this year. Um, first day of scrimmages that same week, CJ Varela threw the ball good. I'm um, trying to go back through. Um, Jensen Elliott, obviously, uh, coming back after a year where he was available the final three weeks of the season. But, uh, you know, Jensen was a, a big time pitcher three years ago. He was a, a Sunday starter on a College World Series team and a heck of a good starting pitcher as a true freshman. And halfway through, or about a quarter of the way through his sophomore year, he went down with injury. And that was a tough time to get injured because it, it took away not only his second season, but it also shortened up how much he was able to compete last year in his third season. So having Jensen back is just a, that's a huge shot in the arm for our team. Um, he's a leader. He's a high-end person. He's a high-end student. He takes everything he does seriously. Um, getting him back is a, I mean, my gosh, that's a, that's a huge kid to get back, right? So uh, him, he comes back off injury. Uh, Mitchell comes back off injury. Those two guys figure in prominently in our rotation. Logan Gregg's a transfer from Connor State College. It's done an awfully good job from day one on campus this fall. Um, I really like where he's at. He threw the ball well in his first outing uh, the other day. Joe Lenhart is back as a senior. Joe's pitched uh, so many different roles in his time here. He's pitched everywhere from a Friday night starter to a Tuesday starter to a, a go-to relief pitcher. He's got great leadership qualities to him. A uh, guy like Peyton Battenfield, who as a junior now is really starting to turn the corner. Brady Basso, another junior, starting to turn the corner. Um, Parker Scott, uh, much like Jensen, uh, missed a vast majority of his first year, his freshman year due to injury, and then uh, missed last year as well. So he comes back to us now uh, healthy for the first time. Uh, and Parker, from the day he got on campus, was a guy we thought could pitch in rotation early on. He had that type of skill. So here we are now, three years later, and he looks like he's not too far away from getting back uh, healthy and ready to help us. So um, probably the exciting thing for a lot of the, the kids is to get back to full health and then to add those guys uh, together to go along with returning guys, guys like Leeper, who had a really good fall, who I think is going to have his best year. Um, Jake Lyons is a transfer right-hand pitcher that uh, – is another really good option for us. He's an older kid that throws a lot of strikes. So I don't want to leave anybody out, but we've got a number of guys that, that really are, are excited about the opportunity for innings. And uh, it's normal to graduate good pitchers. It's normal to graduate good hitters. It's normal to lose guys to the draft. And it's also exciting to see who comes next. And uh, there's a lot of chances for who's next on this team. Players, you have quite a few of your key guys back. Just how critical is that for this team? Well, it's always nice to have guys back. One, you have... Uh, Great relationships built with them, so you enjoy the personal side of interacting with players in their second, third, and in some cases fourth year. So I enjoy that as a coach a lot. Uh, you know them, so you understand what makes them tick, which, again, is, is, a, is a nice thing to have as a coach because you know what you can count on and you know how to, to move guys along and you know who needs a pat on the back and who every now and then needs a reminder about what, what needs to be done. So I enjoy the relationship side of having some guys back and – uh, seeing those faces walk through that door is pretty special. When you get a kid like Colin Simpson back in his senior year and you get to be around that kid and you just really start to appreciate uh, how unique he is, his upbeat attitude. Uh, the glass is always uh, half full with Colin. Um, never seen him had a bad day, man. He's one of those kids that when he walks in the door, he makes sure that you're on top of your game as a coach because he's always on top of his. So when you start looking at some really special kids and some leadership qualities that those guys have, um, yeah, you build around that for sure. But the key to our success will be getting uh, each guy to get to his potential and, and coaching each guy to, to develop their game where they can be a, a, a strong contributor, whether it be a, a skilled offensive player that can bunt the ball and run the bases and play high-level defense or a guy that uh, you're going to count on to drive in runs or, or whatever the case is. You've got to get each player to their abilities, um, to realize their abilities and and 
uh, day like today, there's just as much time that needs to be spent investing in their their mental game as there is their physical game because those two things go hand in hand. So um, I do like the returning players. Uh, I like the newcomers and uh, how quickly we can bring those groups together and, and get guys playing at the peak of their game is the challenge in front of us. How valuable is that, that College World Seri Series experience you're getting and them kind of passing it on to those other guys and Colin, Joe, and, and Jensen? Well, <clears throat> oftentimes, you, you, if you're in programs or get a chance to work in different places, um, uh, you hear it referred to as the, the DNA is in the locker room, the know-how is in there, and you want to make sure that it never goes a generation without it getting passed on. And uh, for so many years here, uh, the College World Series or championship experience, as you see on these walls, it didn't miss a beat. It didn't miss a class. It was, it was part of the DNA of literally every group that came through here in the 1980s. Uh, and then in the 90s, in 90, 93, 96, and 99, it reached and touched each generation of, of cowboy player that played in this program. So the, those stories and that understanding of what a true legacy team is like and what it takes to be on one were passed on and they were shared. And there's a tremendous amount of value in that. Um, to, to, to look at those kids that were part of that team that are still here today, I think what you see in them is tremendous leadership, tremendous core values that those guys still to this day hold on to, that they um, have developed and continue to instill in the younger team members as we try to build a program that uh, stands for all the right things each and every year we play. And, and I don't think you can undervalue how critical it is to have great kids, uh, great workers, but also be some of your best players because then – the other guys look around and say, if this is how it's meant to be done and this is how these guys are doing it, then by gosh, I'm going to fall in behind those guys. And, and so that's the, in the grand scheme of things of building a championship program is having the right people set great standards, um, driving the rest of the group to meet those standards. And as a program, continuing to elevate what we, um, what we believe to be our, our, our yearly uh, goals. And that's to be the very best that each team can be. Um, and, and those kids get that, that's for sure. They do get that. Left side of your infield shaping out with you know losing both of those guys that uh -huh. were primarily there last year. Yeah, yeah, we'll we'll be new on the left side for sure. We got uh, uh, Houston Morrell is a freshman from Florida that's uh, playing a lot of shortstop. He's a he's a good young freshman ball player. He gets on base a lot. He's got a great throwing arm. Um, he's definitely in the mix at shortstop. Max Hewitt's in the mix at shortstop. Max played. Uh, uh, off the bench last year, got some starts late. Uh, good defensive player, another guy with a really strong arm, kind of a bat handler type player, guy that can move the ball around, drop some bunts down. So those two guys give us a uh, good competition at shortstop. At third base, we got a number of guys that are working there. Uh, Christian Funk is, is working both at third and first. Christian played first base last year. He's working some at third. Uh, Cross Factors getting repetitions at third. He's a transfer from Cali County. Um, Andrew Navigato is working both at third and second. Andrew transferred in from Cuesta College and a uh, good baseball player. Um, and Max is seeing some ground balls over at third as well. So there's still a lot of opportunities in front of us. Um, we'll continue to, to grind every single day in the cage and on the field and have multiple guys ready because there'll be some guys get opportunities in the early stages to see how they how they handle those roles and may have some matchup opportunities with some right and left handed hitters depending on who we're facing that given day. So um, there's some there's some definite opportunities. Matt Croon had a great year last year. I mean he, he played his tail off and was a huge part of our success and shifted from third to short and played a an awfully good shortstop. So um, no one really knew where Matty would be last year at this time. He blossomed and had a great year. So we've got to continue to just uh, believe in these kids and, and give them their opportunities. And, and uh, I'm, I'm confident that guys will, will take those opportunities and run with them. This year's roster has a lot of transfers on it. How inspiring mm -hmm. do you think that is to them to see a guy like Matt Kroon who was able to come in one year and make that much of an impact? Well, it's a great story. Matt's a great story, as was Reza. Uh, Ali Aziz last year, both guys in one year's time jumped right in the middle of this thing and, and really helped our ball club. I think you look back, we've had uh, just real real good success with that. Going back to J.R. Davis this one year here on the College World Series team, played a, a huge role. Colin Thoreau, if you think back to that team, was a an awesome catcher on what ended up being a tremendous pitching staff. So I think how how quickly guys are welcomed in and made to feel part of this thing, how, how much they're made to believe in what they're doing. And uh, also some of the adjustments they make when they arrive on campus that give them a chance to jump right in the middle of this. So um, you bring a transfer in usually because of the maturity level, the fact they maybe are a little bit older and stronger and have a little bit of experience under their belt. And you hope that you can use those guys to plug right in and, and fill an opening on your, on your squad.
Christian Funk switched over to third, who would you see maybe stepping into a role at first? Um, well, I, I think the fact that uh, Christian's developing the skill to play some third, he'll still definitely see a lot of time at first. But uh, Jake Taylor's a kid that uh, like his bat a lot. He's taking repetitions at first base to try to find a, a natural defensive fit and get his bat in the lineup. Alex Garcia is a transfer from Central Arizona College that's getting some at bats at first base. So, you know, we have some other guys uh, over there that, uh, again, maybe you're facing a right hand pitcher, you see one type of lineup. Maybe you face a left hand pitcher and you see a different type of lineup. So, um, but again, uh, we got 15, 18 at bats last weekend. Guys have a lot to digest and, and come back to the cage today and work on. We hope to get another 15 at bats this weekend. And uh, as guys play well each day and make positive strides forward, their opportunities are, are wide open. I mean, we're definitely not a team that going into this point in time has a, a hard fixed lineup. And um, some years you may have that, some years you may not. And this is a year where there's still tremendous opportunities for guys to, to have a great day and build on it. What excites you about Logan Gregg? Um, Logan's a he, – he's a joy to be around. He's fun. Um, he's got an unbelievable outlook on everything he does. Um, so, he, first of all, uh, he himself is, is exciting because there's a, an old-fashioned work ethic and a, an honesty about him that every single day you're around him, you know exactly what you're going to get. And I, I really like that about Logan. On top of that, he's about six foot six. Uh, his fastball's in the low to mid nineties. He has a excellent changeup. Coach Walton's done a great job of uh, of helping him get his delivery in a better place, and he's developed a, a pretty good slider since he got on campus to kind of replace his curveball, which wasn't quite as uh, firm as it needed to be. So I think a combination of who he is, his toughness. Uh, and the way that the ball comes out of his hand, uh, there's a lot about him that I think is going to help us win games. Right. More structure, Josh, as far as building a weekend rotation and a midweek yeah. rotation and some of those things will be more settled this year? I think so, Rex. Um, you know, last year we had, to, we had to plan and pivot quite often. And I thought Rob managed the kids unbelievably well. And when you look at the – the way we were able to navigate the the conference play, um, you know, I think we were 16 and 8 in conference, I believe. Um, maybe some of the midweek games we weren't weren't as deep uh, in terms of um, where we've been in the past. A lot of that has to do with injury. That quite honestly is is hard to overcome when it, injuries happen in the middle of years. But uh, last year's team was a it was a series of of uh, setting up each week based upon the opponent, trying to line guys up, put them in the best opportunity possible. We obviously were heavily relying on, on Carson Teal. Um, he was, uh, looking back, what an amazing uh, four-year career he had here, the way he transformed from uh, an unknowing freshman to a uh, gutty, confident, outgoing, visible team leader on the mound. So that was a lot of fun to see. So, um, you know, we, we rode some guys last year who, who carried the load. And then uh, you mentioned some of the other guys that moved on. Um, I think we have a, a more established, uh, healthy, stable of arms that we can uh, put together each week and I think pitch really, really solid baseball behind it. So, yeah, I feel like we'll be a little bit more traditional in that, in that standpoint. In the outfield, you have several returning guys with Cade and Trevor and Carson. What kind of growth have you seen in them so far? Well, they're um, they're hard workers. Those three guys, they never take a day off. You have to force them to not come. You have to force them to leave. They they love to be here. They love to work. They love the experience of being on this team. They love playing at Oklahoma State. Those kids have such powerful intangibles that um, – you know, I think the biggest thing, their work ethic is strong. They're physically strong kids. It's just continuing to get them to believe in their abilities and really uh, trust um, what they train to do every day and then take that to the actual games themselves. And I think if they can do that, all three of those kids have tremendous physical potential. And uh, I think we run the ball down in the outfield awfully well with those guys. They're very physical. They're strong kids. And uh, so much of this game is mental, and so much of, of the mental side is, is the belief in yourself that you're going to be successful and that you are working on the right things to be successful. And I think those kids know that now. Uh, the big step will just be getting them out there and, and taking a deep breath, relaxing, and then letting the game come to them a little bit rather than maybe trying to force things. What interested you guys in Bryce Carter? Well, we knew Bryce a long time ago. Um, I met Bryce when I think he was 15 or 16 years old. I was coaching at Vanderbilt. He was a 
fine player at uh, out of Tulsa. He was a bright young man, great parents. And uh, when I came to Oklahoma State, um, both Coach Walton and myself had a relationship with Bryce. Rob knew him well from his time in Tulsa. And we recruited Bryce um, very aggressively. He ultimately chose Stanford for, for good reasons and went there and got a tremendous uh, education. And at the end of his four years, when he got his degree and had a year of eligibility remaining, he reached out to us and said, I want to play my my last year at Oklahoma State. And it was uh, it was a great fit. He's a, he's a great kid. He, he loves to work at the game. Um, I think he feels like he has a lot to prove on the field this year uh, because I think he feels like his best baseball is yet to be played at the college level. And it was just a, a great time for a, a kid with his, his uh, background and maturity to, to join our program. Never had a problem getting players from all over the country, but this year you've got freshmen from Florida, from New Jersey, from Minnesota. Is that the change in recruiting strategy, or is that just kind of where they came from this year? No, not really strategy. Um, sometimes you come across a player. Uh, John Kelly from New Jersey happens to come from the same high school where, where Coach Walton grew up. So obviously you get a lead sometimes from places where you have relationships. Uh, Nate Peterson, who you referenced from Minnesota, came to our camp. So he brought his talents to Stillwater so we could see him. Um, Houston Morrell is from Florida and played a lot of major tournaments and couldn't help but notice him, you know, playing and playing so well. And so sometimes you you find a, a great fit with a player that maybe is from a distance and, and sometimes you don't. But, uh, you know, our philosophy is going to be to always recruit the best players in the country. And, and that starts for us right here in Oklahoma, where I think some of those uh, the best players are and then kind of branch out from there and, and get the right kids. What kind of positional breakdown do you see for Colin? Colin Simpson. Well, Colin's splitting time right now at catcher in left field. And, um, you know, we'll have him ready to play both. He'll catch. He'll play some left field. We'll, we'll rest him and DH him from time to time if we need to. Um, you know, ideally, the catching position when you're a, an outstanding hitter the way he is, and, and uh, the catching position's a tough one on your body. Can, the little uh, foul tips and balls in the dirt and all the little things that can go into bruising up a wrist or a thumb or a shoulder or an elbow and – that kid never complains. And if you think back to the end of the past two seasons, he's he's caught virtually every pitch the last 20 games of both those seasons. It would be ideal to not have to do that. It keeps you more um, – keeps your legs underneath you, keeps you fresh, and, and it gives you a chance to play and be at your best throughout the entire season. So I think in an ideal setting, uh, uh, you know, being able to work two catchers is, is a good thing, and to have the depth of having a third is, is, is really a – uh, a comfort that we haven't really had. So, um, you know, Colin's a critical part of our team and, and keeping him healthy and in the lineup every day so that he can not only play well on the defensive side, but also keep his legs fresh and, and keep swinging the bat. Coach, would you call Colin one of your team leaders this season? Oh, without a doubt. Yeah, Colin's, Colin's a kid that, you know, leadership comes in so many different forms. Um, I think – <laughs> the most important form, you know, whether you're a basketball fan, who's going to make a big shot when you need it, or you're a football fan, who's going to break up a pass or make a big tackle or, or, or make a big play. And in baseball, who's going to get up and get a big base hit with the game on the line? You know, so you, you get leadership in terms of the player that everyone believes in and wants to see uh, up at home plate or make a certain play to win a game. You also see leadership in the way someone goes about their business. Um, you see leadership in the way someone treats other people. Uh, and you see leadership in the way uh, inside that locker room that teammates treat each other. And I think Colin's a leader uh, in the way he treats his, his teammates. He's, he's a fun, kind kid. He's, he's good to other people. Obviously, he's had a tremendous number of big hits. And, and above all else, Colin Simpson wanted to be at Oklahoma State for his senior year. Colin Simpson could have signed and gone play professional baseball last year. He made the decision to be back at Oklahoma State. Playing here means something to him. Uh, his senior year of baseball at Oklahoma State means something to him. And I don't think you can undervalue or overstate how rare it is anymore to have kids that love what they're doing, love where they're at, and want to stay here and play baseball for their program and their university. That is a uh, special quality, let's just say, that that young man possesses. And, and that decision alone shows tremendous leadership because Oklahoma State matters to him. Coach, who do you see backing up Colin at catcher? Well, Bryce Carter and Colin right now are, are, are splitting uh, a lot of the innings. They're two really good options. Um, Josh Spiegel's a good freshman catcher that unfortunately uh, – 
has mono right now, got sick over Christmas break, and has lost about 25 pounds. So really want to get that young man back and healthy. He's a good freshman prospect out of Pittsburgh who uh, this fall showed some signs of being a really good catcher of the future. He's down right now, and uh, we just need him to get healthy and kind of get back in a normal routine. But when Colin or uh, when Josh rejoins the, the force, so to speak, uh, and Jake Taylor, those four kids are, are all kids that we think are good catchers. And um, that's a hard position. That's all there is to it. You know, having caught myself, I, I know it's a hard position. There's days where you need a mental break. There's days where you need a physical break. And sometimes there's somewhere in between. So to have some depth at catcher will be good for all of them. Limitations on Jensen just in terms of workload? No, Jensen's really healthy. Um, did a great job this winter, uh, really getting strong. He's he's well removed now from you know the surgery that he had, and I think he's mentally and emotionally you know way past his surgery now. So that that guy's ready to go. He's ready to go. He's the text messages I've gotten from him over the last six to eight months. Uh, he too was in Cape Cod last summer uh, as an undrafted free agent. All major league teams were able to offer him a contract and offer him good money. Several did. He said, Coach, I'm not signing. We have unfinished business at Oklahoma State. So when you have players that care about Oklahoma State that are coming back to not only play their fourth year of eligibility but will graduate like Colin, like Jensen, um, as a coach, i, I got to tell you, that means a lot to you because when you set out to do this, you want to create a program and environment where kids are that into what we're doing that they would make those decisions. So to hear him speak that way, to hear him turn down several hundred thousand dollars to be back on this campus this year, um, that's leadership. That's that's owning your spot in this program, and that's wanting to leave uh, Cowboy baseball better than than you found it when you came in. So, I really appreciate those kids. I appreciate all the kids. Don't get me wrong, but when young men nowadays make those decisions on behalf of the program and the school and all the people involved in it, that is a that's a strong character trait. And, and Jensen is very much um, much like Colin. Uh, being here is important to him. Coach, when you look at the Big 12 this year, how do you see it shaping up? Just what do you see kind of the other teams working like? Oh, there's good teams. I, I think I saw, and I enjoy reading what people think going into the season because I think it's, you know, it's food for thought or little brain energy. But um, four of the top ten players in the country are from the Big 12, from what I saw, or at least in someone's opinion, which obviously folks who write those things spend a lot of time studying it and pulling it. So I respect what they write. I think um, – a couple of pitchers and Lodolo and Cody Bradford are the two top left-hand pitchers in the country, or at least two of the top three. Uh, Langoliers, the catcher at Baylor, is an exceptional player. Josh Jung at Texas Tech is an exceptional player. Um, so of the top ten players in the country, you know, four or five of them from our conference, uh, I think the league is really good. I think the teams are really good. I've seen preseason projections that have, uh, you know, teams all over the map, whether – Maybe maybe one or two has maybe been Texas Tech with, with so many good returning players. But behind them, Baylor's good, TCU's good, Texas is good. I like our team. I think Oklahoma has good players. West Virginia returns some really good players. Alec Manoa is another kid that's shown up in the, the top 20 players in the country. Um, and I've never, ever in my life, ever taken a trip to play Kansas or Kansas State or squared off with them where the games weren't highly, highly competitive. So... I think all the teams are, are difficult. I think when you look at Big 12 baseball, it probably models and reflects some of the parity that you've seen in basketball where anyone can beat anyone on any given night, even if you didn't see it coming, it can happen. And um, I think there's great coaches in our conference right now. And I think baseball is really booming in, in the Big 12 area. I've definitely sensed that uh, in the last three or four years that some of the, the transitions that have occurred in certain programs, you, you see a real – uh, uptick um, in what, what some of these teams are doing. So I think the league is highly competitive. And uh, if you're not ready to play each day, you will get beat. What's it been like being able to have your, your brother on the program a little bit? Well, best thing about Matt moving his family back to Stillwater is just getting to see people you love and be around your nephews and nieces. And, you know, just instead of having to call and say hello over Christmas break, you get to have Christmas together and – I think it's, um, you know, it's just fun to, you know, bounce ideas off each other. And we've always talked baseball, but now that we're both kind of getting a little older, you, you realize how immersed in your children's lives you become. And, and uh, it's kind of fun to, to be adults side by side again. Looking at you all's schedule, you have several, a long stretch of home games this season. What does that mean to you to be able to have that much time at LAP? Kind of what are your emotions about it? Well, last year's schedule was 
tough. We played more road games last year than at any season in program history, and part of that's just the way the schedule fell. Part of it was the only way to get good games on certain weekends was to travel, and we felt that was so important to build a powerful schedule. Uh, this year to play more home games will be great. Um, it'll be great to play more games in this ballpark in front of our fans to share Cowboy baseball with them as often as possible. Uh, there's been a lot of time and effort put in to market and promote this year's home schedule with some great uh, giveaways, some great celebrations, some great um, uh, recognition for some of the, the fantastic players and moments that have occurred in, in Reynolds Stadium history. So I hope that people, if they don't have season tickets, will grab them and, and come out and enjoy this, this ballpark. Uh, enjoy the memories that have been created here and celebrate those and, and give the 2019 kids a, uh, you know, a finale of, of, of crowd energy and, and, and passion that will definitely help our ball club. So we're glad to play more home games. We love playing at home. Um, if we could get a beat on weather, we'd play them all at home. But we typically try to travel early just because you don't know what you're getting. But we do have more home games this year, and, and hopefully our fans can really attach themselves to the kids and the, that march to – uh, April time frame and, and then uh, be pretty fired up about what these guys are doing. What are some of the non-conference teams that kind of highlight the schedule for you? Um, well, I, I think uh, I don't have it memorized, but I know Iowa returns back home uh, after going to Iowa City last year. They were actually really good last year, so there'll be a really good Iowa team coming in here. Uh, the coach of Southeastern Louisiana told me this is the best team they've had in school history. Um, said they're loaded, which is great. Um, I think there's a... Uh, Three games this year against Royal Roberts versus two. Well, that's become great interstate series. Four games against the Sooners. Um, the non-conference game in Stillwater, and then the three spread out across the state. Um, we have a trip to Los Angeles where we'll see UCLA, USC, and Michigan get to play a game in Dodger Stadium. I know Rex will be thrilled about that. Um, we have a trip to Corvallis, Oregon to play the defending national champions, which is an awesome challenge. And the unique thing for this group is we already went to Nashville, Tennessee, and played Vanderbilt this fall, who is the preseason number one team in the country. So we are uh, right state. I think the first home weekend uh, NCAA tournament team last year, very, very good program. So uh, there's not a soft game on the schedule, not one. And uh, that's that's going to be good for us. It'll it'll challenge us. And as you build a schedule and you try to build RPI and all the things NCAA's identified for us that matter in their uh, – decisions about who gets a chance to play in the postseason. I don't really see why you would play games that don't prepare you for that or help you in that regard. So we're playing a tough schedule. What do you think are some of the biggest benefits of that ballpark to Vanderbilt? Um, well, we, we saw some some very high-end talent that I think any time as an athlete you, you face somebody that exposes something to you, it speeds up your urgency to make your own adjustments, right? So we saw some really good pitching. Um, Without question, um, our players had some some really good feedback coming home from that trip. We grew together as a team and spent time together that you wouldn't uh, usually have in in the month of October. Um, we were treated in a first class manner, so I think our from a, a, an experience standpoint, our kids had a great experience, which I want for them. I want them to to look back and say, I remember when we went to Vanderbilt my sophomore year, that was a lot of fun. I remember facing these guys. I remember what that did for me as a player. We want we want to build our team through learning and experiences so that when we face those again, we're better prepared. So if you were to play a competitive season and draw a trip to Nashville to play the number one team in the country in a regional, your mindset heading into that could be sound because you've already got something under your belt that, that's shown you what that might be like. And I would tell you the team that made it to Omaha a couple years ago, if you remember back, that team started out, I think, one in six, if I'm right. Is that what it was? I believe it was one in six. We got swept at North Carolina, at Chapel Hill, three one-run games. We we played some super tough road series. And later that year when we got uh, we got our draw and sent to Clemson, South Carolina, that team didn't blink. They didn't blink. And they went there and played about as good as you could have ever dreamed. And the next week we got sent to, to uh, Columbia, which is not an easy place to play. And that group of kids were ready for it because of what they'd been exposed to leading up to it. And so every chance we get to expose the kids in this program to what it's going to take to be the best, we're going to go after it because that's what we want to do is, is um, work our way to where that's the standard for us. Here's being You guys celebrating Alan Pease last year, also celebrating the, the 60th anniversary of the 1959 team. What do you think about the, those throwback uniforms? They look – well, I've never seen a uniform 
that Cade Cabanis or Carson McCusker try on that doesn't look great because of how those guys are built. How that uniform would look on someone built like me, I'm not sure just yet, but they look great on the players. And uh, they're fun. They're, they're, they're a tribute to the great tradition and history of our, our program. We're excited to honor the, the gentleman that, that won that national championship. Our players are excited about it because they love, they love stuff like that. And I think our fans enjoy it because it's a celebration of history, but it's also something we can be proud of, and it looks awfully good. So our equipment staff did an awesome job of recreating that uniform, and Nike was nice enough to, you know, to put it in the, the modern fabric. Uh, it's not made of wool like those ones were in 59, but they look sweet. The kids are excited about them, and when you take pictures of guys that are six foot eight, two hundred and thirty pounds, and six foot four, two hundred and forty pounds, they fill them out in the uniform. They hang pretty good on those guys. So, uh, yeah, we'll be proud to put those on, just like we're proud to put the the uh, Oklahoma State across the chest and that bat and the interlocking OS on our heads. Those we we play for uh, an amazing program. Uh, I, I saw last night on social media, University of Texas put a really cool uh, uh, wall decoration up in their stadium and they were putting it on display and it listed the top 10 teams in the history of college baseball and trips to the college world series and the top 10 teams and wins in the history of the college world series and oklahoma state was listed uh in both those top 10 so just seeing someone else's um artwork and seeing your program's name on it is something you draw tremendous pride in and for us getting to you know be the 2019 version of this is it's a big deal Coach, how have you seen a kid like uh, Dylan Gardner develop from a freshman year to a sophomore year? He's developed well. Um, Dylan's one of those kids that came in a very mature young man. He's uh, very kind and, and um, one of those kids that, you know, uh, you knew coming in he was going to do everything right. You knew he would take every opportunity and capitalize on it, and he's done that. His base baseball skills have improved. His defensive skills are, are drastically advanced from where they were when he got here. Uh, he's a tough little left-handed hitter that uh, can take a walk, can hit a line drive, can drop a bunt, and if he gets the right pitch, can hit one in the gap. And he runs the bases good, and um, he's he's made of the right stuff. Dylan's, Dylan's progressed well here. Okay, thanks for coming.